Hello YouTube, in this video we're going to examine some crime rate statistics on the topic of prohibition, to an extent drug-related but mainly gun prohibition. This is the second video in a series of three, the previous one examining the sociological and psychological effects of prohibition. Link in the description and in an annotation on the screen. We'll be examining some statistics over several nations and also a different set of statistics for specifically the United States. So the main nation of discussion will be the USA. We'll debunk a few myths, address a few stereotypes, and come to a conclusion based on the evidence. First, a minor example to explain the scientific process. One of the common things I hear in the gun prohibition debate is America is so much more violent than other nations. The favorite nation for the USA to be compared to is the UK, and nearly always when a cross-nation comparison is drawn, the UK seems to be the nation of choice. Another YouTuber by the name of Mitch the Noise already addressed this point in one of his videos. Using the crime data tables from FBI.gov and HomeOffice.gov.uk, he discovered that the UK's violent crime rate is actually 350% that of the United States. The USA does have the most crime, but that's because our legal system considers nonviolent drug offenders possessing marijuana and victimless crimes to be a legitimate criminal activity. A common inference made by those in favor of gun prohibition is to point out that America has the most crime and also the most guns. This is junk science, taking a single correlation and automatically assuming causation instead of researching for additional information. I'll apply this same logic to another scenario to demonstrate how ridiculous it is. Imagine if my power went out and I prayed to Zeus for the power to come back on. It came back on a few moments later. If I am to assume correlation confirms causation, this would be concrete proof that Zeus exists and I should worship him as a deity. Or instead, I happen to pray to Thor at the time. It would be proof that Thor existed instead. This is tarot card and psychic palm reader logic, but in science we look at all the evidence available to us, not just one single correlation that's been cherry-picked. Now on that note, we can counter-dispute the crime rate differences between the USA and UK, this time in favor of the prohibition argument, because science cares not for bias, science cares about the facts. One could dispute the point of the 350% crime rate jump to not be quite as large as it seems, and they could do this by pointing out the fact that the UK books criminal activity differently than the USA does. The point is that booking violent crime rates is difficult in a cross-nation comparison, because you can't just compare two countries side by side who have very different laws and definitions of those laws. So for this video, to address this problem, we're going to focus on statistics that are a little more difficult to distort. Mainly, we're going to look at the homicide rates. We'll look at a cross-nation comparison and then stats specific to the USA. This is a chart I was pointed to in a comment on one of my previous videos by someone in favor of gun prohibition, pointing out that the USA has a high homicide rate by firearm compared to other Western nations. But let's expand the information and actually look at multiple cases instead of just one single country. We'll skip countries that have concealed statistics. It seems a lot of Arab nations and some African nations and South American nations have their stats concealed. Also Russia and China also have their stats concealed by this chart. Thailand, too. I thought that was odd since I figured some of those would have available stats, but whatever. Now, the argument in favor of prohibition of firearms is that by reducing firearms will reduce crime and homicide. The idea is that if you have firearms, a more efficient tool for killing, people will use it to kill more often, and thus a nation with many guns will have more homicides than a nation without guns. It's very common to point to America's high homicide rate as a form of citing evidence for this. Now once again, this is junk science, taking a correlation and assuming causation. If this prohibition theory were true, then there should be some level of consistency with firearm ownership rates and homicide rates. So let's filter this list by rate of ownership. The next one with unconcealed statistics below the United States is Switzerland, 88.8 to 45.7. We have almost double the rate of ownership of Switzerland, however, we have much more than double the firearm homicide rate, 2.97 to 0 0.77. So just shy of four times the firearm homicide rate of Switzerland for two times the guns. But let's calculate the actual homicide rate, not just the ones with guns. Now we can take the percentage of homicides that are by firearm and use that to obtain the real homicide rate. In the case of the USA, 100 divided by 60 equals 1.66. So we multiply that by the firearm homicide rate, 1.66 times 2.97, and that gives us 4.94, the actual homicide rate of the United States. Now let's do the same with Switzerland. 100 divided by 72.2 is 1.38. 1.38 times 0 0.77 is 1.06. So Switzerland's actual homicide rate is 1.06, a little under a fifth of the United States. But wait a minute, firearms are used in more homicides in Switzerland than in the United States. Surely this would mean Switzerland's homicide rate would be higher. Switzerland's firearm homicides make up 72.2% of their homicides, as opposed to America's 60%. Well, no. Once again, junk science. The idea behind prohibition is that if guns cause so much violence, then surely the homicide rates of a country without guns will be lower than one with guns, right? 
Well, let's continue investigating. Finland is next on the list, ranked fourth on the world's gun barons. Their firearm homicide rate is 0.45, and percentage of homicides is 19.8. So 100 divided by 19.8 equals 5.05. 5.05 times 0.45 equals 2.27. So Finland has only a little less guns than Switzerland, a 0.4% difference, and yet firearms are only used for about a fifth of the homicides, and it has over double Switzerland's total homicide rate. So let's skip down to everyone's favorite comparison nation, the UK, or England and Wales on this list. A 0.07 homicide with firearm rate. Isn't that a nice looking number? Surely this is concrete proof that prohibition works. Well, we have a problem. There's less guns, but guns are also used in less of the homicides, so let's check. 100 divided by 6.6 .6 equals 15.15. 15.15 times 0.07 equals 1.06. Exactly the same homicide rate as Switzerland, even though Switzerland has, let's see, 45.7 divided by 6.2 equals 7.3 times the amount of guns by rate of ownership. Let's grab another couple of particularly peaceful nations. France has a 31.2 rate of ownership, much higher than Britain, and their firearm homicide rate is 0.06, a little under Britain's. Well, you know the drill. 100 divided by 9.6 equals 10.4. 10.4 times 0 0.06 equals 0 0.62, a little over half that of Britain's homicide rate. How about Norway? They've got a lot of guns. Surely they aren't civilized. More guns and also a lower firearm homicide rate than Britain's. Let's see. 100 divided by 8.1 equals 12.34. 12.34 times 0 0.05 equals 0 0.61. Oh, but look at South Korea. Doesn't that one look appetizing? 0 0.03. That's even lower than all of those so far. And look at how few guns they have. Only a 1.1 rate of ownership. Surely, this one will prove that if you enforce prohibition of guns harshly enough, and your laws are strict enough, prohibition is the answer. Let's find out. 100 divided by 1.7 equals 58.8. 58.8 times 0 0.03 equals... 1.76, about three times the homicide rate of Norway or France, and higher than Switzerland or the UK. Ouch. Can you detect my point yet? Now, Japan has an even lower homicide rate than all of these nations that I've listed. 0 0.55 to be specific. A little bit lower than France and Norway, and they do have less guns. But across the span of many nations, there is no detectable arc that fits the prohibition argument. If the point of gun prohibition is that nations with guns have high homicide, and nations without guns have low homicide, then it would imply some level of consistency between the homicide rates and rate of firearm ownership. This is not demonstrated to be the case. The USA happens to be a nation that has high homicide, and happens to have a lot of guns. Japan happens to have low homicide, and also happens to have a small amount of guns. But two countries that have been cherry-picked for use in a debate ignores the actual result of the statistics, that being that no legitimate arc is displayed. Switzerland has 41.5 times the rate of ownership of firearms of South Korea, and yet you're less likely to be murdered in Switzerland. An increase in the amount of firearms does not indicate an increase to homicide rates on a cross-nation comparison. At best, you could make the case that it increased the rate at which a firearm is used for a homicide out of ones that are already bound to take place, but in the case of Britain, France, and Norway, that's not even true, and you'd already be willing to make the concession that the victim dies either way at that point. I would call fighting over the method of death rather than the prevention of said death to be bad prioritization. In Honduras, with only a 6.2% firearm ownership rate, they have a gigantic firearm homicide rate of 68.43. I could say this was concrete proof that gun prohibition doesn't work, but that'd be junk science, just like the argument of prohibition in and of itself. Because it doesn't take into account any other factors, like how easy it is for a police force to enforce the law in Honduras. There are too many unaccounted factors that aren't given to you from this chart. You aren't told about the country's culture, about its police, about its laws, etc. What this chart does tell us is that the presence of guns, if a factor at all, is not the primary factor, and even if there was a connection between firearms and violence increase, it'd be so small that it's drowned out by so many other factors that it's not even noticeable. The only trend that you can note from this chart, by organizing it in rate of homicide, is that third world backwaters have high homicide rates, and advanced nations have low homicide rates, and the rate of gun ownership jumps around. Though for the most part, the biggest gun barons are western nations with low homicide rates. The United States is an unusual exception to this trend, with a homicide rate far greater than the rate of gun ownership would indicate if there was any link between ownership rate and homicide. All of the nations that beat the United States in terms of gun homicide have under a fourth of America's firearm ownership rate. Most have under an eighth.
The trend clearly displayed by this chart is that nations that struggle to provide a dependable standard of living to their people face desperation, and desperation means more crime, not a presence of guns. Now let's stop with the cross-nation comparison for a bit. Let's focus specifically on the United States for a minute. This is another chart I'd like to show you, because one could argue that nations with different cultures and different values are different. Let's narrow it down a bit. This is a comparison of the states of the USA for homicide rates as well as firearm homicide rates. Now, states in the USA are often large enough and populated enough that they may as well be considered countries, but let's look at this chart. The location in America with the lowest rate of ownership of firearms is the District of Columbia. It has a 3.6% ownership rate. It also has the highest murder rate in the entire country, for both firearm and non-firearm kills. The highest is Wyoming, with a 59.7% ownership rate. It has one of the lowest homicide rates in the country, ranked 6th. But let's take the national average. Let's sort the list by rate of gun ownership and see. Not on two specific states, but over the course of the whole nation. We'll split it in half and omit the District of Columbia. The 25 states with the lowest gun ownership rate, and the 25 states with the highest. And we'll add up the homicide numbers for both and compare them. For total homicides, the 25 states with lower ownership rates came out to 100.8. The 25 states with higher ownership rates totaled out to 91.2. Let's try specifically firearm homicides, 66.2 and 58.8. So the states with more guns, on average, have less gun homicides and less total homicides than ones with lower gun ownership. And keep in mind, I didn't even include the District of Columbia in this, which has enough population to qualify it as a state. So omitting it wasn't even fair, and including it would have wedged the visible gap even wider than it already is. Now you may be wondering, how can this be? How can more firearms, a tool for killing, possibly create less violence? How does that make sense? Well, I can explain it to you. A firearm is an equalizer. A 125-pound female can engage a 220-pound male and have equal odds if she knows how to use her firearm properly. Equalization is only a risk if you have a large percentage of people who would use equalization in the interest of committing crime and not preventing it. We have many more law-abiding citizens than we have criminals. A criminal is much more afraid of engaging an armed victim than they are empowered by having a gun themselves. If that 125-pound female is better at the quick draw, if you blink as a rapist, you just took a bullet to the head. Criminals do not like equalization. If you are a criminal and you want to rob someone, and two people are going down separate dark alleys and you must pick one of the two, one is a young teenage female and one is a grown male in full military uniform, if you have any sense, there's no chance you'll pick a fight with the one in military uniform, because criminals prey upon the weak. This also brings up the point of junk science again. Another popular myth floating around is that guns are used more to commit crime than to prevent them. This fails to consider any crime prevented by the threat of force, which goes undocumented. While it could be difficult to verify exact numbers from this, claiming it doesn't exist or shouldn't be factored would be deceitful. It would be like claiming having security for the president is pointless because, as long as you've had that obvious security there, no one's attempted to assassinate him. The contention is absurd. Equalization threatens criminals much more than it threatens the law-abiding citizen, and that is why guns reduce crime instead of increasing crime. You may be able to cherry-pick incidents where a gun got more people killed than another tool would have, but that argument can also be countered by noting that in most cases like that, none of the victims are armed, and that's still ignoring the fact that the statistics on a large scale don't indicate that having guns banned would be cost-effective in terms of lives lost. Furthermore, I'm to believe that if I fully plan out conducting a murder on someone, and I plan how to get rid of the body, how to make it a disappearance instead of a murder as far as the police are concerned, fully plan where and when I will conduct the murder, that upon discovery that neither I nor my victim have a firearm, that I'm then going to call the whole thing off. This is already assuming that I can't procure an illegal firearm, which is funny considering the various stats I showed you already. Furthering the list of bizarre misconceptions is the massive support I see for limitation of rifles. Despite the fact that in the United States most firearm homicides are done by handguns and you're more likely to be bludgeoned to death by someone's fists than you are to be killed by a rifle according to the FBI.gov's homicide tables, yet the idea of banning rifles has much more support and attention from what I've observed. Once again, this is the fault of people using junk science and being badly informed on topics they have strong opinions about. And with all that said, firearms are still only a minor point. Firearms influence the ease of access a criminal has to commit crime, but ease of access is a minor factor, as opposed to motivation and its subcategory of desperation, as demonstrated in the Nation Chart, in the Crime Stats from FBI.gov, and in my previous video. I refer again to the video produced by Mitz the Noise and the FBI crime data tables he cites. Most of our crime in America comes from urban population centers, where a lot of people are packed into a small area. I'd argue that this is a reflection of people generally being more poor, in more poverty, and more desperate. And I touched on this point in my previous video on the subject, where I also discussed educating people about firearms, so I won't repeat that here.
Another YouTuber by the name of The Amazing Atheist also made a video on American violence where he points out the murder rate is spiked by drug prohibition, another outside circumstance that is not accounted for when blaming firearms. In conclusion, guns are not essential to obtain low crime rates for society, as demonstrated by Japan, and they're not as important to keeping crime rates low as the right wing in the United States would lead you to believe. Prohibition, or the lack thereof, are in fact minor points. But legal guns do help lower the crime rate to a significant extent, even though their contributions are not as significant as education, healthcare, drug prohibition, and other big factors. Another observation one could make is that the homicide rates in the USA have been dropping significantly over the past 20 years, and no major party seems to be claiming credit for that. Is it because video games and social media provide more stress relief? Is it because DNA and cameras make it easier to catch criminals? Perhaps it's a combination of both, yet I'm not sure there's sufficient evidence to consider either to be proven correct. This is not the logic offered by Prohibition, though. The point of those in favor of Prohibition is that we should invest a large sum of money on implementing and enforcing the Prohibition of Firearms. As this results in an increase to homicide, we're left questioning what the point is, because when you get down to the bottom line, as a head of state in the USA, looking at the idea of gun prohibition, I'm being asked to spend billions of dollars to increase our homicide rate. Gun prohibition makes the extraordinary claim that banning firearms, investing billions in the implementation and continuous enforcement of that ban, and jailing people over the issue, would provide benefits to my crime rates outweighing the massive costs associated with it, but it fails to provide extraordinary evidence to back up this claim. The statistics indicate that this isn't the case, thus prohibition is taken on faith, not on science. Not only am I to assume correlation implies causation, I'm to avoid using the same line of logic to dismiss the arguments of prohibition. Thus, gun prohibition logic wants its extraordinary claims that come attached to billions of dollars in costs to be accepted as fact without appropriate evidence, while counter-arguments are dismissed even when they have equal or superior evidence. That logic belongs in a theocracy that worships forest spirits and accepts paranormal claims as fact, not in an advanced nation where people can read, write, and are scientifically literate. I'd much rather spend that money on improving our educational system and actually obtaining lower crime rates and a better economy from the whole deal. Thus my solution, based on the evidence, is that the state needs to provide a dependable standard of living to its people, and if it does so, crime will be lower. Better health care, a healthier economy, and most importantly, better education. If we want to lower our crime and homicide in the United States, guns aren't worth addressing, nor would they be even if they did actually boost the crime rates. Even if there was some outside factor distorting all of the stats that I've shown you, and that could potentially be the case, because that's the way science works. New information, changing the whole thing, could come out tomorrow. But with the information we have today, the idea that firearms increase crime is a point taken on faith and in defiance of the evidence, and even if it were correct, firearms would still be such a minor point that they wouldn't be worth the money to prohibit when that money could instead be spent on vastly more cost-effective use, reforming our broken educational system, and raising the standard of living of the average citizen, for much more profound effect than any direction a prohibition could ever achieve. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.